So first of all, we want to uh, want to thank the uh, JYM Jewish, uh, Jewish Youth of Mexico for putting together this seminar and for all the work that they do with college students in and out of the universities and for the Jewish youth of Mexico at large. Also, we want to dedicate tonight's uh, class in memory, Le'iloi Nishmas, for the ascent of the soul of Yosef Yitzchok ben David and David ben Avram. The Neshamas should have an aliyah. Tonight's topic is um, a topic that affects all of us, a challenge for all of us, some of us more, some of us less. They say there was one time there was a, a guy comes to his, uh, comes to a psychiatrist's office and he's uh, sitting on the couch and he says, doctor, I want to tell you why I came to see you. I have a real struggle with happiness. I, uh, I'm very unhappy. So the psychiatrist listens and he says, listen, I could take your money. I could let you keep coming and see me, but really I have a better advice for you. He says, you know, it's your first appointment, I don't know you, but you say you're not happy. Listen, it's just your luck, but today the circus came to town. And in the circus, there's a clown called Pagliacci. And everybody who sees Pagliacci is full of joy and mirth and laughter Everybody leaves Pagliacci's performance so happy. So instead of you coming to me, you're going to come every week and you're going to come for months and for years, I'm telling you, just it, this, is, this is your lucky day. The circus just came to town. Go to the circus, get a ticket, go to the circus and watch the clown Pagliacci. The guy says, doctor, I can't do that. Doctor says, yes, of course you can do it. Go do it. He says, doctor, I'm telling you, I can't do it. He says, yes, you can. Go. Just get a ticket. Go to the circus. Go see Pagliacci. Do it. Go see Pagliacci. You can do it. He says, doctor, I can't do it. He says, why can't you do it? He says, doctor, I'm Pagliacci. Okay. You guys all saw, saw that coming. Uh, anyway, what's the struggle with being happy? Why is it so hard to be happy? So I'll tell you like this. To begin with, because the whole concept of happiness is backwards especially in English. Everyone speaks English, right? <laughs> I'm in trouble if you don't, because I've been speaking English for the past five minutes. Anyways, but the word happy in English itself is a giveaway that it's a problem. The word happy, you know what's related to? Happen. Something that happens. It just happened. It's luck. We use the term happenstance to mean a coincidence. Or if something happens, it's an accident, it was bad luck, we call it a mishap. So already, the whole perspective of happiness is that happiness is something that happens to you, which makes, makes us victims and puts us at the mercy of whatever's going on in life. Instead of taking control, Instead of deciding our own emotional state, we make ourselves reactive. By the way, <laughs> I was interested before I came on, I wanted to see if it was similar in Spanish. Because the word happy, happen, it's a Germanic etymology. So uh, I wanted to know what's the etymology of uh, felicidad. Please don't judge my terrible American accent. But uh, I looked it up, and uh, feliz, happy, is it comes from uh, Latin, but it comes from the world, uh, uh, the word of fertility, fecundo. It says it applies to. Uh, Tierras y arboles, 
land, like soil, again, terrible American accent, but like soil and, 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 and trees. So basically it's talking about in the olden days when a person, a farmer, you know, would go outside and he would see that the crops are growing well, oh, then he'd be feliz, he would be happy. It's the same concept. It's basically saying that he's waiting for something else around him in his environment to be good. And then based on that, he'll have a positive emotional reaction, which is completely backwards, is completely the opposite than the way that, from the way that it should be. In other words, it's the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. What's the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? Because there are people who are thermometers and there are people who are thermostats. But what does that mean? A thermometer tells you the temperature in the room. A thermostat tells the room the temperature. You understand the difference? A thermometer person is a person who you look at his face and you can tell how life is treating him. You can tell if his wife yelled at him before he left the house. You could tell if he got stuck in traffic on the way to work. You can tell if his stock portfolio was up or down. He's a thermometer, basically based on how things are going around him. That's his emotional state. He's reactive, like a thermometer that tells you the temperature in the room. So his emotional state tells you how things are going in his life. As opposed to what? A thermostat. A thermostat, you put the setting on the thermostat, the thermostat makes the room that temperature. The thermostat tells the room what temperature to be. There's a person who's a thermostat person. He gets up in the morning, he decides on his emotional state. And then he emanates that to everyone and everywhere he goes. <laughs> so, from a Jewish point of view, we want to be a thermostat and not a thermometer. We want to put our setting from the very beginning, from the moment we wake up, we want to put our setting, we want to choose our emotional setting and not let the world dictate to us how we should feel this day. I remember when I was a kid, we used to have this bus driver who was a philosopher. And um, every day he would say the same corny joke to us and I used to be annoyed at by it as a kid, but when I grew up, I realized that, that it was profound. He used to say to us that every day, after, as we would get off the bus, he would say, hey, have yourself a great day, unless you've got other plans. <laughs> Took me many years to realize the profundity. Have yourself a great day, unless you've got other plans. We choose whether or not our day is going to be great. What does that mean? Does it mean that uh, we're out of touch with reality? Does it mean that we pretend that nice things happen to us even when they didn't? When people frown at us, we're, we're deluded, we think that they actually smiled at us? No, that's not what it means at all. I'll tell you what it means, but I'll tell you a story first in order to help us understand a little bit better. There was a chassid back in Russia and he was eventually thrown in a worker's camp, in a prison in, uh, in Siberia. And he was arrested for helping other Jews get out of Russia to uh, escape from behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, when he was in Siberia, he was in this, uh, basically this, this gulag, this work camp, and most of the other prisoners there were common criminals, what, uh, what they call Cossacks. These were real uh, unsavory people. And there was this, this Chassid, this Jew, and then there was also a professor. The communists often were suspicious of, of professors and intellectuals. Um, basically anyone who knew how to think for themselves. In fact, they used to tell a joke in, in, in the Soviet Union. They used to say, why does the KGB work in groups of three? Because you need one who knows how to read and one who knows how to write 
and the third one to keep his eye on the two intellectuals. Okay, they didn't like people who knew how to think too much. So there was this professor who was in this uh, this gulag, this prison, this workers' prison, along with this Jew. So um, one day the professor says to the Jew, he says, you know, I've been watching what goes on here in this camp. And I noticed something interesting. I noticed that there are fairly young men who are fairly healthy. And what happens is in the morning when they come to get us up for a day of slave labor, they used to go out into the forest and cut trees. So he says, uh, when they would come and get us in the morning, you'd see sometimes a guy can't get up off the cot. He's just lying there. And he physically doesn't look like he's sick or anything, um, but he just doesn't get up off the cot in the morning. And then at the end of the day, we come back and he's dead. And I, I, I see that they don't die from a, an, an injury or from, from starvation or from disease. They just, I believe that they lose their will to live because I believe that being here in this place, they lose their will to live. And I, I literally think that they die from having nothing to live for. He says, but however, the professor says to the Jew, he says, uh, you are an exception to this. And, and I'm trying to figure it out because you also are here in prison with us, but I see that you have a certain zest for life, a certain joie de vivre, a certain uh, excitement, and that not only do you not lose the will to live, but you, you have a certain contagious excitement about life. And I'm just trying to figure out the difference between you and these guys. So, um, so this chassid, this Jew, he says to the professor, he says, listen, I want to explain something to you. These guys that you're seeing who, who are dying, who are dropping like flies, who you say they, they lost the will to live and they died, let me explain something to you about them. These guys are common criminals. These are low lives. These are not very, uh, not very refined people. For them... Their life is three things. These are Cossacks, okay? For a Cossack, life is three things. A horse, a rifle, and a bottle of vodka. He says, when, when they got sent here, they don't have their horse, they don't have their rifle, and they don't have their bottle of vodka. So if life is those three things for them, and now by being here, they don't have those three things. But those three things are life itself. What does that mean? It means life itself was taken from them. And it's only a matter of time before the body will get the message from the brain that we're dead already, that those things that are life to us were taken, and therefore we're already, we have no life, we're already dead. And he says, that's when you see them, the morning that they don't get up off of the cot and they can't move, that's when the body got the message from the brain that life is over already. Because the things that they consider to be life, they don't have when they're here, so they lost life. The chassid, the Jew, continues, he says, however, I want you to know that for me, when they sent me here, they didn't take anything from me. Now, I just want to pause for a second. He says, they didn't take anything from me. The man didn't see his wife and children for 14 years. He was working as a slave. He was living in a, in, a, in a labor camp in Siberia. And he says, they didn't take anything from me. But he proceeded to explain. He says, listen, what's life? Life is you try your best to serve God. That's it. And uh, so what does that mean? Back home, let's say, when I, you know, before they arrested me and sent me here, I worked in an office. I should mention the reason he was in an office is he was forging passports. He was getting Jews out of Russia by giving them fake Polish passports so that they could sneak out. From there, from Poland, it was easier to get to, uh, to Western Europe or to get to, to Israel or to get to America. So 
he says, back at home, I'd be sitting in my office and I would look out the window in the afternoon and I'd see the sun is setting. And I would know it's time I have to stop and I have to go to the synagogue and I have to pray the afternoon prayer. Okay. He says, over here, it's not that different. Okay, now I don't work in an office. I work chopping wood out in the frozen snow. So I'm chopping wood, and I see the sun is setting, and it's afternoon, and I have to pray the afternoon prayer. Now I can't go to synagogue because there is no synagogue. And I can't even stop and pray because they'll come over and shoot me if I stop. But while I'm chopping wood, I silently pray. I say the afternoon prayer in my in my mind. I silently pray. And in fact, I think to myself, wow, in all of the years since God created this earth, I bet you nobody has yet stood on this exact spot and said his praises. And for that, I'm exceedingly thankful. So you see, he says, by sending me here, they took nothing from me because when I was home, my life was about trying to serve God as best as I can. And over here, it's the same life. I also tried to serve God as best as I can. What did they take from me? My life is, my, is still the same life. So going back to our question, a person who refuses to let his environment tell him how he should feel. A person who refuses to let the way people treat him or the way life treats him determine how he should feel. How is that possible? Is he deluded? Is he in denial? Is he pretending that things are going well when they're really very difficult? No. The difference is he has a different way of defining life. And that's the secret. Some people, like those Cossacks who defined life by the, the horse and the, and, the, and the rifle and the vodka, some people define life as what you get. And therefore, when they don't get what they're accustomed to getting or what they want to get, then they have a bad life and they're unhappy. Other people define life by what they give. And the secret when you define life by what you give, is that no one can ever take that away because in any time, in any place, we can always be of service. We can always be useful to our maker and to those around us. And that can never be taken from us. So the secret to real happiness is to stop being happy because happy is something that happens to you. And instead, to be besimcha. Besimcha is the Hebrew. Besimcha means in a state of joy. Be means in. Simcha, joy. In a state of joy. And the Kabbalists tell us that be simcha in a state of joy, in joy, besimcha, the Hebrew letters of the word besimcha, are the letters machshava, which means thought. Machshava is thought. Bisimcha is the same letters, machshava. If you want to be joyous, it has nothing to do with what's going on around you. Joy is all about what's going on in here. It's about reframing. It's about how to see what really is the definition of a good life. Is a good life about getting everything you think you need? Then, I'm sorry to say, sometimes life's going to give you what you want. Sometimes it won't. And when it does, oh, then you'll be happy. When it doesn't, oh, then you'll be sad. And life will be a roller coaster. Or you can define life by your ability to be of service, by your ability to be useful, by your ability to do something for God, to do something for your fellow human being. And that can never be taken away from you. We can be useful in any situation. There's, um, 
there's a Torah portion called uh, Chaye Sarah, the life of, of Sarah, Sarah, the, 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 the matriarch. And there's an interesting thing there. At the very beginning of that Torah portion, it tells us how old she was when she passed away, 127 years old. It says she lived 100 years and 20 years and 7 years. These are the years of the life of Sarah. And Rashi, who is the foremost commentator, he addresses an unspoken question, which is, why does it tell us these are the years of the life of Sarah? We know that these are the years of life of Sarah. They told us this is what it's counting, 127 years. 127 years, these are the years of the life of Sarah. We know this. So he explains like this, that the verse is coming to tell you that her years, the years of her life, kulan shavin litova. They were all equal in goodness. Shave means equal. So kulan shavin letova. They were all equal in goodness. Hold on a second. Anybody who knows even the most basic stories about Sarah knows she had ups and downs in life. She had... She, when she when she was a girl, her 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 father was was killed by the king, by 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 Nimrod. Then uh, she left her land. Then she, she married uh, Abraham, and then they went to another land, and then they had to leave that land. And then there was a famine, and then they went to Egypt, and then she was kidnapped, and she was in the palace of 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 Paro. And then they came back to the land. They made a lot of money and they were rich. And then they brought many people close to Hashem. And then she was barren. She couldn't have children for so many years. And then she gave birth to Yitzchak, to her son. There were the tough times. There were the great times, the ups and the downs. How in the world am I supposed to understand Kulan Shavin Latova, that it was all equal in goodness? I see her life. It was up and it was down. So what's the answer? The answer is, again, what we said already. How do you define a good life? I was once at a shiva, at a house of mourning. You shouldn't know such things. And I heard somebody, I overheard somebody sigh and say, oh, he had such a bad life. Now, I happen to have known the deceased. And I, I said to this person, why do you say he had a bad life? And this person said, well, because he lost so much and he had so many struggles, so much challenge. I said, excuse me, that's not a bad life. A bad life would be if somebody wasted their life. They were given talents and opportunities and resources and they did nothing but sit on the couch and they didn't love anybody and they did nothing for anybody that's a bad life this person had a great life yeah a lot of hard things happened to him but he did so much for so many that's called a good life but you have to know how to define what's a good life if you're saying a life is determined by what happens to you yeah, the guy she was talking about, a lot of bad stuff happened to him. I guess you would say that's a bad life if that's how you define it. But if you look at a life by what comes from you, what you do, what you contribute, what you give, he had a great life. He did so much for so many others. And he turned his challenges into a motivation to, to be such a giver. So you have to turn the whole thing around from the way the world tells us to look at it. They tell us that happiness happens or uh, that, 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 that happiness is when you go out and you see that your, your, your plants are growing well and you're happy because something good happened to you. No, that's not at all the case. Happiness is what you're able to do with your life, who you can help, where you can be useful. And that's what it means when it says about the life of Sarah, our matriarch, our mother, she taught us the secret of life, a good life, has nothing to do with what happens to you. To the contrary, 
there are ups and downs in what happens to you, but in every situation, like the story of the Jew in the gulag, in the work camp, what he told the professor, he said, what did they take from me? How is my life so different over here than it is back home? That's the message of Sarah. That whatever happens to me, life goes up, life goes down. That's just the, what's happening to me. But I'm not a therm uh, I'm, not, I'm not a thermometer, I'm not a reactive person. I'm a thermostat. I choose my emotional state, and I emanate it out from me rather than letting it come to me. Or like my bus driver used to tell us, "Have a great day." Unless you've got other plans, we have to make plans that we're going to have a happy day. And thereby, when you have a happy day and another happy day, another happy day, you have a happy life. But not because of anything that happens to you, but rather how you use your life. You know, there was an actor. Well, there's still an actor. I think he still, uh, still works. But he was very, very big back in the 90s. He was the first actor to make $10 million for one movie. And the story is, we're talking about uh, Jim Carrey. He had been homeless and he was living in his car. And he couldn't get any work. No one would hire him. And when he was at his lowest point, he wrote himself a check for $10 million. He wrote himself a check, obviously not a real check, but it was a symbol to him that he's worth $10 million, that he's good enough, and someday he will get $10 million to, to be in a movie. So when he was homeless and living in his car, he wrote himself a check, $10 million, and he put it in his wallet. And he kept that check with him in his wallet day after day, month after month, year after year. And he kept it with him until finally he became the first actor in Hollywood who ever got paid $10 million for one movie. Amazing. His dreams, his wildest dreams literally came true. And after it happened, he said, my hope, my wish for every man, woman, and child in this world is that all of their wildest dreams should come true just like my wildest dreams came true so that they can see that when that happens, it won't make them one bit happier. <laughs> so here's the person who was homeless in his car. He wrote himself a check for $10 million. And years later, he got paid $10 million. His dreams came true. And he says, I hope that happens to everyone. So everyone can also see that all your dreams can come true. It doesn't make you happier. We have a question, by the way, that came in. I want to encourage questions. You can type in the chat. And also, you could type uh, directly to me. You see where it says, uh, to everyone? So you can actually just uh, scroll down. You can find my name. Um, it's not alphabetical, unfortunately. But you scroll around, you'll find my name. You find Chase Taub, and you could send me a direct message if you want, or you could just post it to everybody. Here we go. Hello. There. So we have a question here. Is it more difficult to be happy when you have everything you need physically or when you are squeezed? <laughs> That's a very profound question. You know, they say that uh, people who win the lottery, they've done a study. In fact, more than one study that the majority of lottery, well, I mean, you can Google it. You're on the computer now. You want to go Google it. Google you if, you, if you, right now you can. You could also Google my Jim Carrey quotes. You can Google everything. You can fact check me. I'm not like Trump. You can fact check me. Anyways, <laughs> um, th they say, based on studies, that the majority of lottery win winners um say that it's the worst thing that ever happened to them it's interesting why do they say it's the worst thing that happened okay they, they, they many of them are bankrupt within i think within five years they're bankrupt 
Um, many of them experience losses in relationships. People turn on them. They don't really know who's their real friends anymore. But it ends up becoming a, a, a curse. And uh, I think this is a good example. When we don't have anything, well, let me put it this way. How about this? Let's think about Jewish history. Okay, Baruch Hashem, thank God, we are the richest, safest, most privileged Jews that ever lived in history. We are. And ask your grandparents, okay? Um, and wherever your family came from, you know, they didn't, they didn't come from Mexico. I mean, they, they came there 100 years ago, 150 years ago, however long it was, maybe even more recently than that, right? They came from somewhere, whether it was from Morocco or from Lithuania or from Poland or from, or from uh, Yemen, right? You go find out how your great-grandparents lived or your great-great-grandparents lived. And if they could see how we live, they would think that we are literal royalty, right? So historically speaking, Jews were, they didn't have the things that normally people are supposed to have to be safe, to be secure, to be comfortable. We didn't have these things. We were poor, persecuted. We had very little protection, if any, under the law. And yet, the Jewish people, with our faith, with our optimism, and don't let anyone ever tell you that terrible Jewish stereotype that we're worriers and that we're negative. We laugh at that. We make jokes about that because we have a sense of humor. But we didn't carry on through all the, the worst brutality that happened to a people and pass that down successfully to our children, generation after generation, because we're a bunch of negative people. It's not so. We laugh at it, so we have a lot of jokes. Jews have a lot of jokes about negativity because we, that, we laugh at that. But we're the most resilient people, and we're very, very, very positive. So to answer your question, you see, who has a harder time having a positive attitude in life? People who have nothing or people who have everything? Obvi obviously, you can see from history that our great-great-grandparents, they had nothing, but they had what to live for, and they were happy. And we have everything, and we have the biggest challenges. Now, I don't, want you to I don't want you to misunderstand me and think that it's our wealth or it's our, our technology or it's you know, the privilege that we have that makes us sad. That's not true. God forbid. These are gifts from, from Hashem. These are blessings. It's not that, they, that having all the stuff we have makes us sad. It's just that it just doesn't make you happy. The only thing that makes us happy is what we are talking about before, how much you give to others, how useful you are, being productive, serving your maker, and serving your maker's children. That's what makes a person full of joy. And for our great-great-grandparents, they had no other option because life didn't give them anything. So they knew life was about what they were going to give, not what they were going to get. We can get confused and think life is about what we get. But those things that we get don't make us happy. Like Jim Carrey said, let you, you could get everything you ever dreamed for. That's not going to make you happy. But I'm not saying, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that, God forbid, we shouldn't have the safety and security and the, and the affluence and the bounty. These are all wonderful things. It's just that itself doesn't make you happy um, unless you're already living a meaningful life and you're doing things and you're giving to others. I got a couple of private questions that came in. I want to deal with those. How can you help someone that just lost someone to see happiness in the world, to help them become a thermostat? Wow. So I want to tell you something. One of the things our sages tell us is a great paradox. And that is that everything that we've been saying so far is for us. We say this to ourselves, but we shouldn't say it to someone else. When we see somebody else who's going through a difficult time, our response should not be to tell them 
well, you know what? Just make up your mind. Try to look for the positive. Stop worrying about what you're getting from life. Focus on what you have to give to life. We're not allowed to say that. We should say it to ourselves. But when it comes to somebody else, we're supposed to be compassionate. And compassion means we offer a shoulder to cry on, a listening ear. We, we give what we can give, which is our support. Somebody suffered a loss. Obviously, there's nothing we can do to actually make up for that loss. We, the only thing we can do is be supportive. But we never tell them, oh, you know, just try to see the bright side of things. We don't do that. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because my pain is my teacher. Okay, I'm going to say that again. My pain is my teacher. In fact, my pain is probably my most valuable teacher. However, your pain can never be my teacher. I'm allowed, not only allowed, but I must find meaning from my suffering. But I'm not allowed to find meaning from your suffering. In fact, when I see you suffering, if anything, my response should be, God, how could you? When he does it to me, I say, thank you, God. You know exactly what you're doing, and you're giving me the experience that I need to have right now. And even though it's painful, especially because it's painful, I'm embracing it. I'm accepting it. But when I see pain go to somebody else, no, I cannot accept it on their behalf. Imagine the, uh, the, uh, the post office comes and they mix up the address and they bring a delivery from Amazon to, uh, to your house. And it's really, it's meant for your neighbor. You didn't order it. And you look at it and it's a new laptop. Very nice, a new laptop ordered from Amazon, but it's got your neighbor's address on it. But the post office put it on your on your front door. So you're going to think to yourself, oh, okay, lucky day. I'm going to take this laptop, a free laptop, right? <laughs> no, you're not allowed to do that. Why not? Because it's not your laptop. It's your neighbor's laptop. I can't accept something that wasn't sent to me. It was sent to him. Well, that's exactly the point here. I can't accept something that wasn't sent to me. I can't accept it if it was sent to him. I can only accept it if it was sent to me. If God sends me challenges, if God sends me adversity and pain, I could accept my own challenges and adversity and pain because they're my teacher. But I can't accept somebody else's pain. So therefore, my response is compassion. And I don't try to tell them that they should accept whatever it is that they're going through. Now, what I can do is I can model it in my own life. I can show how I do this with my challenges. But that's, that's the limit of it. So it's an interesting paradox that the way we respond to our own adversity is the opposite of how we respond to somebody else's. <clears throat> Somebody wrote here a private question. What's the first step to see life in that way? That's a great question. Uh, the first step, how to see life in this way. So I'll tell you very simple. How do you see life as a good life is what you give. A good life is not about what you get. How do you do that? What's the first step? Okay. So I'll tell you like this. I'm a rabbi. I'm not going to shock you if I speak about God. The difference between a good life being what you get and a good life being what you give is if life is self-centered or God-centered. When my life is about me, how I'm feeling, how life's treating me, right? That's called self-centered. As opposed to what? What's the opposite of self-centered? God-centered. God-centered means my focus is on service, how I can be of service, how I can be useful to my maker and to my fellow creations. 
there's a verse in uh, the Psalms of King David. King David's uh, Yorzeit was yesterday. The anniversary of the passing of David HaMelech was yesterday. And por favor apagar sus microphone. I don't know what apagar is. What's apagar? Mute? Probably wasn't to me because they assume that I can't read Spanish, which I can't really. What's apagar? I want to learn a new word. Nobody wants to tell me? I know pagar is to pay. What's apagar? Mute. Okay, thank you. Muchas gracias. Aprendí uh, palabra nueva. Thank you. How you like my American accent? You never heard such bad Spanish before, have you? Okay. Anyways. Um, so there's a verse from King David. It says like this. Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid. I have placed Hashem, God, before me, in front of me at all times. What does that mean? I placed Hashem in front of me at all times. It doesn't mean I made a sign and I put it in front of me. I have placed Hashem in front of me at all times means that uh, I'm God conscious. I'm thinking about God all the time, as opposed to what? Thinking about myself, being self-conscious. Self-conscious is, are they looking at me? Do they like me? I don't know. Uh, am I comfortable? Do I turn up the air, turn down the air, close the window, open the window? That's self-conscious. God conscious is, Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid. I have placed Hashem before me at all times. So the Baal Shem Tov explains something beautiful about this verse. And you may even remember the word because we mentioned it earlier. Remember we said about Sarah, about her life, about all the years of her life, even though things that happened to her went up and down, but her attitude was always the same. Kulan shavin latova. It was all shave, it was all equal. So the Baal Shem Tov explains, Shiviti Hashem l'negdi tamid. I place Hashem before me at all times. I'm God conscious at all times. Shiviti is from the same word as shave, equal. And he teaches like this, beautiful teaching. How, what is the secret to having that equal, that equanimity, that emotional stability, not being a roller coaster that goes up and down. What's the secret to being even, emotionally stable? Shave is shiviti. Shiviti Hashem l'negdi tamid. That when my focus at all times is on Hashem, what can I do to be of service? What mitzvah can I do? Then I will find myself emotionally even. But if my focus is on myself, how are they treating me? Do they like me? Am I happy here? Do I, am I, am I, do, I, do, I, do, I do I like what I see? Do I like what I hear? Is, this, is the food too salty? Is the food too warm? Is it too, is it too humid? Then I'm miserable. Then I'm mis or, or sometimes I'm happy, but sometimes I'm miserable, and it's just up and down. So step number one is don't ask what life can do for you. Ask what you can do for life. Very, very, very simple. Okay, and that's called being God conscious. All right, I have another question here. But how, how do we achieve having that state of mind? Because many times we're not used to it, so it's, it's not something mechanical. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. brilliant question. That's why we need to meditate. That's why we need to meditate. It's not the default. It's not default factory settings. By the way, I'll tell you, there's, there's a story. In the shtetl, in the old country, there was a boy, he was studying in a yeshiva, and he ran away from his yeshiva, and he went to another yeshiva. And uh, so when he came back home to visit his family, the old teacher caught him and said to him, hey, why'd you run away from me? Why'd you go to the other school? He says, well, they taught me something you could never teach me. So he says, what? What did, what did they teach you? If, if they taught you something I can't teach you, then I forgive you. So he says, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. I'll tell you one, one thing they taught me you can't teach me, then you'll forgive me. He says, yeah. He says, they taught me how to read minds. You know, to, uh, to be psychic. How to, <clears throat> to tell what people are thinking. So the teacher says, well, if they taught, I, I can't teach you how to read minds. But if they taught you how to read minds, then I forgive you because I can't teach you that. But you can't just say that. You have to prove it. So teach me. So tell me. What, are, what am I thinking right now? If you could read minds, then tell me what I'm thinking. 
So he says, okay, well, I could only read your mind if you're concentrating. If you're thinking about a thought very deeply, then I could tell you. He says, okay, fine, no problem. I'm doing it. I'm thinking. He's like, you're thinking? He's like, yes, I'm thinking. You have to really think. He says, yeah, I'm thinking. I'm thinking, right? Okay. And he says, okay, I know what you're thinking. He says, what? What am I thinking? He says, you're thinking, Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid. I have placed Hashem before me at all times. I am always God conscious. And the old teacher says, no, I'm sorry. That's not at all what I'm thinking right now. And the boy says, I know. That's why I ran away from you and went to the other school. Okay. Anyways, it's not natural to think this way, but we have to train ourselves to think this way. And that's what we do in our quiet times. If you can take 30 seconds, I'm not exaggerating, 30 seconds a day and devote it to meditation. I'm not talking about conventional prayer. That's a separate thing. I'm talking about your private quiet time between you and God where you actually think. Now you're going to say, how do I think? Do I have to sit on the floor? Do I light candles? Do I have to hum? You know, no, that's not Jewish meditation. That's not how we meditate. Jewish meditation is much more it's like a conversation that you have, except you're not having it with somebody else. You're having it with yourself. So you take one idea. Take some idea that you've studied. Now, presumably you're studying Torah. And if you're not, well, then Rabbi will hook you up with some classes. I'm sure there's some opportunities to, uh, to study. But you go and you study. You, you take a class idea. You say, okay, that's a great idea. Now... He's going to te text me the opportunities so I can uh, study opportunities here. Okay. Um, put it on the, I, I turned off my, my phone so I wouldn't get texts during the thing. So you send it to me in the private chat. And I'll tell everyone to study some Torah. And so you take an idea that you studied and, uh, and you think about it. What does it mean thinking about it? I don't know how to think about stuff. Yeah, you do. You know how I know to think about things? Because you worry, right? You know how to worry, right? <laughs> if you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. Because what's worrying? Mm -hmm. Worrying is you're imagining something that didn't even happen yet. So it only, it only exists in your mind. And you think about it so much that you have an emotional reaction to it, right? Mm -hmm. Or... I'll tell you another example of meditation we do all the time, which is resentment. I tell this to people in English all the time. Don't get it, but uh, you, guys, you guys will get this. I tell them, you know what a resentment is? A resentment is to feel something when it's not happening. It happened before and you feel now. A resentment is a re-sentiment. It's sentir, it's to feel something when it didn't happen now, it happened in the past, it happened 10 years ago, it happened 20 years ago. You guys are young, you don't realize. People, some people, old people, we have resentments for 40 years, 50 years, 70 years. People carry resentments for decades, for their whole lives. And it's, it's amazing, if you're Jewish and you're like a bargain, this is a bargain. You get hurt once and you get to feel offended about it for decades. You just keep milking it. If That's what a resentment is. A resentment is also a meditation. Because it's pain that you're feeling, but it's not happening now. It is that you're hurting, you're hurting about. It happened a year ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. But you're feeling it again. Why are you feeling it again now if it's not happening? Because you're meditating. You're thinking. So the point is our brains are really powerful. We know how to worry. We know how to have a resentment. We know how to think about things until we have an emotional reaction. So the same thing is. We can take 30 seconds and we can think about how God is creating the world. How God sent my soul to the world for a purpose. We can think how everything that happens is according to what plan. Everything is by divine providence. And as we let those ideas into our mind, it changes it changes the eyes that we look at life with and we experience our entire day differently. 
And I promise you when I tell you, if you start with 30 seconds a day, especially in the morning, because if you do it at the beginning of the day, then it'll affect you for the rest of the day. If you do morning meditation, you will rewire your thinking and you will see things differently. Absolutely. Okay. Um, can you give us some sort of task to start off the week, kind of like happiness for dummies? I'll give you a task to start. What do you mean start off the week? Because this, because today is Sunday or for every week? Or why does it have to be week? Why not today? How about a task to start the day? I'll give you a task to start the day. Here's the task to start the day. Get up in the morning and you go to the bathroom before you do anything. Yeah, before you check your phone, yes, you say, and you can say it in any Jewish. What does that mean? Hereby, give thanks to you, living and eternal king. You have graciously restored my soul. Great is faithfulness. You start your day with gratitude. Gratitude and humility. How so? Gratitude because I'm already a winner. I got my soul back. I didn't die in my sleep. I woke, back, I woke up. He gave me back my soul. I'm here again. I'm a winner already. Everything after this is a bonus. <laughs> humility. You know why humility? Because I didn't put myself here. We remember our day and we remind ourselves, I didn't put myself here. Keep me here. And therefore, I work for him. And if he put me here, you know what that means? It means I have a job to do. It means I have something to contribute. I don't know what life's going to give me today. That's up to him. But what I'm going to give to life that's up to me. And I have to know that I have a lot to do today. And I have to be on the lookout. When I walk into a room, what do I want? You know, when you walk into a room, you scope out the room, you see who's there, you see what's going on. What's the default way that anybody looks around in a room? They see what they can get, you know? Who should I sit next to? You know, who looks like, uh, you know, if I sit next to them, then I'll be in the, the, the popular, right? You know, who, who should I sit next to? You know, I'll make a good business deal. Uh, you know, who's good looking? I sit next to them. You know, you know why you want to sit next to them, right? So uh, you scope out a room and you figure out what's going to benefit me in this room. And your whole entry into the room is all based on that. What am I going to get? What, what's, what can I get from this situation? Flip it. Just flip it. Flip it. You walk into a room and you scan around and you look for the person who needs you. Look for the opportunity to be of service. Look for the person who's sitting alone. Look for the person who is uh, maybe looks like they're a little bit down right now. And reach out to them. I promise you that'll make you so much more joyous than this way of walking into a room where we try to get something. So start your day with this meditation. I, I'm thankful to you, God, you back my soul. That means that you want me here. You have a job for me. And now I'm going to spend the rest of my day looking around for how, how many opportunities I have to do my job. <clears throat> Let's see, I have two more questions. <laughs> this is great. I'm very, very impressed with how many questions came in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this question. If God is perfect and complete by himself, and by that he doesn't need anything, why do we need to serve him? Yeah. So can God create a, a boulder so heavy that even he cannot lift? So I'll tell you something. God is not a weakling. God is not a, uh, a wimp. Everyone knows what a wimp is, or is that too, too American? A loser. But let me ask you something. 
when somebody gets married, when a man gets married, does he get married because he needs somebody to wash his socks? Well, maybe some people do, but I don't think that's a fair marriage. Does he get married because he needs somebody to uh, cook his breakfast? Not an emotionally mature person. An emotionally mature person, actually. And I think this is something I'll throw in here, free dating advice for you young people. Nobody's to get wrapped up in somebody else's life if that person is needy. You know, the, the people who say, I'm a wreck, I can't get my life together, but maybe if you love me, <laughs> I'll figure things out. No, thank you. Mm -mm. No, I don't need that. I don't need that kind of drama. What are we looking for? If we're healthy. I'm saying if you're healthy. If you're unhealthy, then unhealthy looks for unhealthy. But if you're healthy, you're looking for somebody who says, I don't need you. Oh, I know. In all of the love songs, they say, I need you. I'm nothing without you. Right. Okay. That's cute in a love song, not in real life. Nobody wants to be texted at three in the morning. I need you. I'm nothing without you. I'm standing at the edge of the bridge. No, I'm sorry. That's not a turn on. A real mature relationship is where you say, no, actually, I don't need you. I'm a competent adult. I know how to live. I know how to take care of myself. But I want to have a life with you. And therefore... I'm making myself vulnerable to rely on you. Not because I need a cleaning lady or I need a cook or I need somebody to keep me company or somebody you know, to, 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 to give me this or to give me that or because of this, this need or that need. No. Because I'm a mature, emotionally independent adult who's chosen that the ultimate fulfillment is to bond with my other half. God looks to us as his other half. That's why when King Solomon wanted to explain the relationship between God and his people, he wrote Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, which is a love poem, a romantic poem. Because the metaphor for this relationship is romantic love. Mature emotionally healthy romantic love so of course god can do anything to do for himself this isn't about us being his housekeepers or being his workers being uh, employees that would be silly it's about being in a marriage and fulfilling each other knowing what what he wants what he desires the Ratzon Hashem, the desires of Hashem, 613 of them, in fact. And we give them to him in order to fulfill him in the most deep way that only a spouse can, can fulfill a spouse. Okay, we have one more question. There's so much more to be said about that topic. What advice would you give to a young man who's lost motivation at home and is giving up, eating garbage and struggling with Shmira Tabrit. Okay, that's a good question. It's an honest question. It's a realistic question. I'm wondering if the question has to do with the current situation of quarantine and if that's what it is, or you're saying in general, that uh, you know, at home, and uh, I don't know if you're saying you're at home because you're stuck at home because of quarantine, you can't leave home, or if you're saying uh, just that's where you are in life right now. You're you're at home, you're not going out doing much, and and you lost motivation. Um, okay, but I'll answer a general way that could apply to either. Yeah, now especially. Thank you. Okay, you just updated it. Thank you. Now, actually, yeah, even more so now. Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. 
Remember we spoke about it at the beginning. Life is not about what you get. It's about what you give. There's nothing that you can change in your situation right now to make yourself get more out of life that's going to change your motivation, that's going to change really your self-esteem and your self-respect, because that's what you're describing right now. You know, not taking care of yourself and, you know, doing, making sure you're not healthy, not spiritually healthy, not emotionally healthy, not physically healthy. It's a lack of self-esteem and a lack of self respect okay so then how do i get to have a esteem as love how do i love myself again and how do i respect myself again by the way i just want to tell you something interesting um because uh whatever because to me what's the difference between love and respect whether it's self-love or love of others or self-respect or respect of others love and respect are <coughs> are interesting emotions. Love is what you do for the one you love. Respect is what you don't do because of the one you respect. Um, what do I mean by that? I was one time, you guys ever heard of a country called Argentina? Yeah. I heard one time from a guy from Argentina, he said, he went, I'm not making this up now. He said he went to Mexico, a Jewish guy from Argentina. He's in Mexico. And he was hanging around with Mexicans, non-Jewish Mexicans. He said he had more discrimination being from Argentina than from being a Jew. That like that was more of a stigma that he was Argentina than the fact that he was Jewish. Anyways, I don't know, maybe it's a football thing. I have no idea. Don't ask me. I'm from Chicago. I don't know any of this stuff. Anyways, okay. Yo soy de Chicago, okay? <laughs> Yo say. Nada. All right. Anyways, so I was in Argentina one time and I, um, oh, no, I was in Chile. I was in Santiago and the guy who was supposed to pick me up Friday morning from the airport didn't pick me up. So I missed my flight. So I had to go to the, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Santiago. It's beautiful. It, it's like California. It's like on the Pacific. It's gorgeous right on the mountains. Anyways, so I'm in Santiago. It's Friday morning. And I have to get to Argentina for Shabbos. And I, I, I went to the airport. And you guys hear my Spanish. You know how great, how great my Spanish is, right? I missed my flight because, whatever, a whole long story. And now in my broken Spanish, I'm trying to explain to them that I have to get to Argentina now. I have to get the next flight. Anyways, there's two, there's two major airports in, in Buenos Aires. One of them is right in the city, like real close to the neighborhood. And the other one's like way, way, way out. Okay. Anyways, I was supposed to go to the one that's <clears throat> right in the city, but I just begged them, you know, in my broken Spanish, I'm like, just put me on the plane, get me to Argentina. So they got me on a plane. I All I thought to myself was like, I got to get over the Andes. I got to get over the mountains and then I'll figure it out from there. So then, okay. So I land in this airport in, in Buenos Aires called Ecesa. And so now I'm like, I finally, I call the, I call the people in, in Buenos Aires. I'm like, okay, I'm at the airport. Which airport? Oh, you're an hour away. Okay. How do I get there? You got to get a car. Fine. So I get in the car and they have a thing called, they're called the autopista. The autopista is a, it's a highway. It's like a big highway out in the middle of nowhere. So anyways, we come to the, um, the toll booth, you know, the toll booth in the, the autopista, you have, to, you have to pay to go on it. So there's a sign there that, that says, I want to try to remember if I, I want to get this right, okay? Uh, Por favor, no toque la bocina. Respete nuestro lugar de trabajo. Okay, that's what it's... Please, I'm going to translate for you because my, my Spanish is so bad that you're not even going to understand what I said. Please do not honk the horn. Respect our place of work. That is actually the exact correct definition of respect. Respect isn't asking you to do something. It's asking you to not do something. So please respect me. 
Respect me means don't go there. I told you I have a boundary. Don't go past the boundary. Stay back. Love means do something for me. Bring me flowers. Respect is, hey, I made a boundary. Stay back. Now, what's self-love is when you do something kind for yourself. What self-respect is when you say no to yourself. So this question is really, what do you do when you lost the motivation to care for yourself, to say yes to yourself about the things that are appropriate to say yes? And you lost the motivation to say no to yourself about the things appropriate to say no, to have self-respect and say no to yourself. <clears throat> so here's... And here's my answer to you. The only way to get back self-love and self-respect, it's not going to happen for you. Life's not going give it, to give it to you. Nothing outside of you is going to give it to you. The only way you're going to find it again is by giving. The only way to get out of this rut way to get out of your own head because that's that's really what you're saying is you're stuck in your own head oh and now i just got another question how can i get above thinking about myself and think of others okay. or god yeah well this is the same question here it's the same thing we're talking about how do you get out of self the prison of self do something kind for else do something to be of service give something and if you can't find someone to, to, to help, which trust me, if you look around, you'll always find someone. Even if you're stuck at home. Remember, everything is divine providence of Hashem put you in this place. This is where he needs you right now to be. This is where you can do something. So around the people under the same roof as you. Some, do something. You know, be nice to your parents. Be nice to your siblings. Be nice to your married. Be nice to your spouse. I mean, come on. Be nice to your children. Your children, you know, I got to tell you, there are two kinds of experiences that people are having right now with the quarantine, heaven and hell. Heaven and hell. And what's the difference? There's an old metaphor. There was, there used to be a preacher back in the, in, in Lithuania. And he used to come to a different town to give his sermons. He used to always say you know where i just came from i just came from hell and i want to tell you what it was like in hell. i went to hell and there were big long tables with platters of delicious food and everyone looked sad and i was like why are they sad they're sitting in front of a, <clears throat> in front of a banquet and then i got close and i saw that everybody's arm had a stick tied to it so they couldn't bend their arm they couldn't bend their elbow and they had soups at the end of their hand tied to the end of their hand so they were trying to eat and they couldn't they would get the food at the end of their their, their the spoon they couldn't bend it they couldn't eat it so they were all just holding food like this and they were all frustrated they were all upset and that was hell he says then i went to heaven heaven what did i see the same setup the same tables with the same platters of the same food but the people were smiling they were happy i went over i took a look why are they happy and i saw one of them said to the other one excuse me could you pass me the potatoes <laughs> and he says oh why of course i can and he scooped up the potatoes in the spoon and he fed the person across from him. He, he, he took the food and he gave it to the person across from him. And they fed each other. Each person fed the person across from him. So this, uh, this preacher used to say this, this uh, story in his sermons. He said, so I see now that hell and heaven are the same place. The only difference is the people. <clears throat> there are people right now who quarantine is hell and other people for whom it is heaven. There are people right now who are bonding with their families in such a special way. And there are kids who are going to have such beautiful memories, remembering it was a weird time, but they're going to remember all the time that they spent together with the family, getting to know each other again. 
And then, unfortunately, we know there are many families that have the opposite situation. The difference isn't the situation around you. The difference isn't the house itself is different, or this house has more different things in it, and this house has other things in it. The same house, the same things, the same furniture, the same everything. The only difference is how they both treat each other. So we can make our lives heaven. We can make heaven around us by seeing the person across the table from us. Look across the table, person there. Reach out to them. I promise you, you're depressed right now, you're unmotivated, pass the potatoes to your family member at the table and you will be a little bit less depressed. And then you will be able to do more and more and more. And technology is an absolute gift to us. You can get on and you can contact anyone in the entire world right now. You think that you're lonely, there's people who are lonelier than you, or at least as lonely. Reach out to them, do something for them. Contact somebody because that you're lonely and you want them to fulfill you. Contact them because you want to fulfill them. I promise you it'll work. Look, I got to tell you something. It works for me. I'm on here for the past uh, hour and 40, no, hour and 17 minutes. And I haven't thought about my own personal problems the whole time. It's beautiful how it works, right? <laughs> it's the best medicine. <clears throat> anyway, I don't know how much longer should we go over here. We're good. Should we wrap it up? Yeah. We're still listening. Robert, what do you say? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Yeah, okay. You'll tell me, you'll tell me when we had enough. I thought it was already, enough, but it's uh, bastante, it's enough already. Dayenu, like we say, it's enough for us. Okay, fine, if there's more questions, we'll keep going. Um, okay, I see one here. This one is, let's do the last one. Okay. How can we feel happy for slash with others? Okay, so you didn't spell out what the question means, but I'm going to read a little bit into it. I'm going to read a little bit into it. What does it mean? How can we truly, truly feel happy for others or with others? That implies that sometimes we feel falsely happy for them. You know what I mean by falsely? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> but you said truly. Truly happy. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the thing. Why do we not feel happy for people? You know why? There may be other reasons as well, but I know one big reason why we fail to feel truly happy for others. And that is because... Well, let, let, me, let me back up and explain something. Each one of us has a little bit of an animal inside. And that animal is the survival impulse. That's, you know, we're talking about being stuck, having, being stuck in me, being self-conscious. Well, the animal or the survival impulse is all about me, 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 me. Because it has to be about me because it's supposed to keep me alive. It's self-preservation. Babies are all me, 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 me. So if a baby wakes up hungry in the middle of the night, he doesn't care, he just screams, he wakes up everybody, he doesn't care. Me, 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 selfishness. The animal inside of us tells us, you gotta make sure that you get what you need. And if anyone competes with you for resources, you gotta 
outcompete them. You got to outmaneuver them. And you got sure, you know, like a bunch of uh, animals in the forest are all competing over the over a certain amount of food, and you're competing with them. And you got to make sure to get your food, or you're going to starve. You're going to die. You're going to be the weak animal. To eat. So that it's always telling you, you got to compete, and you got to be better than everyone else. And if you see another animal who has something, so what that means. That means there's less of that nice thing for you. Yeah. So when we have trouble being happy for us, it's because that animal inside of us tells us, oh, oh, that guy has something nice. You know what that means? It means now you're in danger. He has nice stuff. Well, now there's less nice for the rest of us. That's where jealousy comes from. Jealousy means... You know, I want something that doesn't belong to me. Why would I want something that doesn't belong to me? Because I'm really afraid that if he has what belongs to him, now I'm not going to get what really belongs to me. And here's the thing. You have to have faith. You have to believe in God. Hashem sends to each of what is meant for us. There was an old Hasidic master who used to say, God always gave me everything I needed. If I didn't have it, that was the best proof I didn't need it. We're always being taken care of perfectly. And nobody else can take what comes to you. Nobody else can take what God has meant for you. So when somebody else has a little bit of happiness, it's not going to decrease the amount that you're able to have. Think about it like this. Happiness anyways is not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing, like we were talking about before. It's not about having more stuff or better stuff. It's about being able to be of service. So it's not physical, it's spiritual. Physical things, look, you don't have to know a lot about physics, and you know the way physical things work is that a physical thing can only be in one place at a time, right? A physical thing cannot be in two places. So if he eats, the, now the cookie's in his stomach, it can't be in my stomach. That's why, you know, physical resources, there's a shortage. Now that person has it, don't have it. Two things can't be in one place, and one thing can't be in two places. However, spiritual, spiritual entities are different. They're not limited in place and time in the same way. I'll give you an example. If I have a dollar, you have a dollar. A dollar is a physical thing. It's a physical thing. You can pick it up. You can touch it. If I have a dollar and you have a dollar, and I give you, your, I give you my dollar and you give me your dollar, how many dollars do I have and how many dollars do you have? The same dollar. I started with a dollar, you started with a dollar, I gave you mine, you gave me yours. Nothing happened. We both still only have one dollar. But let's say I have an idea. An idea is not a thing. It's not a thing. You can't touch it. You can't even see it. You can imagine it. You can... Think it, but it's not, it doesn't have substance, not physical. So let's say I have him, and you have an idea. And I tell you my idea, and you tell me your idea. Now, how many ideas do I have, and how many ideas do you have? I have two ideas, and you have two ideas. How did that work? Because it's spiritual. It's not limited to place and time. The dollar, when we trade... Now I have a dollar anymore. You have it. Or a cookie. Or a piece of meat. Or a house. Or a car. They're physical things. So if you have it, I don't have it. But spiritual entities, if I have an idea and you have an idea, and I tell you my idea and you tell me your idea, now we both have two ideas. If I am happy because I have a life of meaning, and you are happy because you have a life of meaning. 
there's no shortage. By having happiness and meaning in life doesn't decrease the amount that's available for you. Doesn't take away one bit what is available to you. And your having happy meaning in life doesn't decrease the amount that's available to me. So it comes back down to what we started with. We have to redefine our whole way of looking at what is a life. Is it about getting and getting things? Or is it about giving and giving spirituality? Spirituality, I mean being humble, being grateful, uh, love, kindness, generosity, intangible things. By the way, you know what I love about the Spanish speakers, French speakers too, but you can use the fancy Latin root words in English and the people understand it. With the English speakers, you say like intangible, they don't know what it means. But Spanish speakers, they all know the words that are considered fancy in English are not considered fancy in Spanish, so I love that. Anyways, <clears throat> yeah, I'll do one last question here. We really always have a choice to get out of our own heads and choose joy choose to give, sometimes it seems impossible. <sighs> sometimes it's very hard. But if you can't yet do it mentally, at least you can act as if. If you can't literally get yourself out of your own head by focusing on something other than self, at least you can do an action that is selfless. So you can get up and you can bring something to somebody else. You can hold the door for somebody. You can give a call to somebody. Call your mother. Call home. Do something as if you were out of your own head. Really, I'm not out of my own head. I'm sitting thinking about myself, but I can act as if I'm thinking of someone else. And I'm telling you that that has a powerful effect on your insides until eventually you do get out of your own head. Thank you very much, Rabbi. That was really nice. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Been a been a blast. Me gusta mucho. De nada. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Buenas noches. Signing out. Yeah, Isaac, I love you. Have a good night. I love you too. Thank you.